Hi there, my name is Moya McTeer and I'd like to welcome you to World Building 101. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to learn what world building is, what speculative fiction is, how to world build. You're actually going to get the chance to practice world building on your own after uh, I give you some examples of how I've done world building in the past and after we do some world building, at least as together as we can in this online format. Uh, but yeah, that's really what we're going to be doing here. I don't know where you found this video, if you found it on my website already or if you saw it on Twitter or on my YouTube channel, uh, but no matter where you found this video, there is a worksheet that goes along with it. You can find the worksheet by going to my website, moyamcteer.com. That's M-O-I-Y-A-M-C-T-I-E-R. Dot com. Uh, you can find the worksheet there, and it has uh, all of the stuff that I cover in this lesson with space for you to fill in your answers to the different questions, to the different prompts, uh, and so you can follow along in the worksheet. Uh, but yeah, let's get started. Now before we get into the actual lesson, I'm going to introduce myself, give a little bit of background info for me so that you know who it is you're learning from. Like I said, my name's Moya, and I'm an astrophysicist, a folklorist, and a science communicator living in New York City. But I grew up in the middle of nowhere. Uh, this actually is my childhood home. I grew up in a very small coal mining town in southwestern Pennsylvania, very rural. Uh, I was the only black person there. I actually graduated uh, in a class of about 55 people. So there weren't a lot of people around, there weren't many things to do, and to keep myself occupied, because I was an only child, I read a lot. And most of what I read was fantasy and sci-fi. Uh, my mom and I watched a lot of uh, movies and television shows, also fantasy and sci-fi, or speculative fiction, or spec fic, uh, if you want to abbreviate it. So I, I grew up living in these imaginary worlds. Part of that was to escape uh, living in rural Pennsylvania as a young black girl, uh, but part of it was just because I thought it was really fun. I absolutely loved learning about these worlds that other people had just completely come up with in their own heads, uh, and I wanted to learn how to do that. Uh, so fast forward a long time, I was lucky enough to go to Harvard University for college, where I, I had no idea what I wanted to study, but through a kind of complicated and circuitous route, I found my way to astrophysics and folklore, both separately, uh, but I didn't want to give either one of them up. And at Harvard, if you want to study two fields, you have to write a thesis that sits at the intersection of those two fields. And that's what I did. Uh, as an astrophysicist, I study planets outside of our solar system. Those are called exoplanets. And I guess you could say that as a folklorist, my specialty was fictional world building. So to combine them, I wrote a science fiction novel. And the novel was set on a planet that I studied, a real exoplanet. Uh, I gathered the data for it. I analyzed the data. I came up with measurements for how big the planet was, uh, you know, everything else we can learn about a planet with our current technology. Um, and the plot of the story was based on ethnographic research that I did in Hawaii. Uh, and so I wanted this book to be as scientifically accurate as it possibly could be. And so I, I talked to psychologists and evolutionary biologists and um, uh, architects and linguists, and I, I talked to them about what life on this planet might be like, given what we knew about the actual planet and its characteristics. And so this was really my first experience doing a large fictional world building project. Um, of course, since I've taken classes in world building. I have done a lot of world building projects since then, and I wanted to share my knowledge with you. The goal here is for you to learn how to make a realistic enough world that you can set a real story in it or, or make real art that represents that world. So are you ready to get started? I know, I, I, I can't hear what you say, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I, I'm ready to get started, so let's go. Uh, first, I want to I want everyone to I want you to prime your mind, uh, and so we're going to be thinking about building our own fictional worlds. But let's start by thinking about the fictional worlds that already exist. So I want you to take some time and think about what your favorite fictional world is. This can be from TV, books, movies, video games, uh, really anything you want. 
I'll say that one of my favorite fictional worlds is Narnia. It's a classic, and it's a classic for a reason. I love the idea of talking animals, of, of magic working. Um, yeah, I'm a big sucker for, or for beautiful magical systems. Uh, so once you have your favorite fictional world in your mind, I want you to take some time and write down three specific things that make your favorite fictional world different from our own reality. So pause the video here and write down your three ideas. All right, great. Your minds are primed. Uh, let's move on with the lesson. All right, so first let's get into some definitions. I've been throwing words that are like world building and, and speculative fiction around, but what do they actually mean? Uh, so when I say speculative fiction or spec fic, what I mean is a, a type of genre that includes any type of elements that don't exist in our real world. And those elements can be advanced technology, they can be magic, they can be uh, gods or goddesses, they can be talking animals, They really anything you want. Anything that you won't see just walking down the street uh, in our real world, that belongs in speculative fiction. Uh, and here are some examples of speculative fiction. Chronicles of Narnia, which is my favorite fictional world, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Star Wars, uh, Harry Potter, uh, The Legend of Zelda, Pokemon, all of these different examples uh, are speculative fiction. And the really cool thing, which you might see if you look at some of these examples, is that speculative fiction can cross media. And so speculative fiction can be books, uh, movies, TV, we have video games here. Um, I can't think of anything else right now. I feel like that probably covers it. But yeah, speculative fiction uh, is anything that is that might not be considered realistic. And one of the things that sets speculative fiction apart from other genres, like uh, historical fiction or memoirs, or I'm just coming up with genres off the top of my head, is that it includes an element of something called world building. Uh, world building is the process of exactly what it sounds, building a world. So you're construction, constructing a fictional world or universe uh, to set your story in. Uh, Neil Gaiman called world building the joy of getting to play God. And I, I think he's right. Uh, Neil Gaiman is one of my favorite authors. Uh, and so when you're world building, a lot of people think that uh, world building is just about creating a setting. It's not. It's so much more than that. If you do world building well, it can drive your plot, it can motivate your characters, it can help you make other decisions that are really important in writing. It's not just about where the characters are doing their actions. Um, and so that's what world building is. Uh, let's move on. So I told you before that my first big world building project was writing a science fiction novel in college and that novel was set on a planet that I studied. That was an interesting exercise because in some ways I was really constrained in what I could do. I had the physical characteristics of the planet and I, I didn't want to stray from those but I also wanted to make uh, everything else that I made up on my own uh, kind of build off of the physical characteristics that were real, right? I didn't make up those characteristics. And so the, the real characteristics of the planet were that it was a, a relatively small planet, just a little bit smaller than Earth, but it orbited a, a star that is much smaller than our sun. And that star was cool, uh, so it had a lower temperature than our sun, and it was much more magnetically active than our sun. And so there were a lot of flares coming off of this star. So I took this and I thought, how would that actually affect the life and culture that evolves, that forms on this planet? And so this is what I came up with. Uh, first of all, I called the dominant life forms on this planet Malians. Uh, I decided that Malians probably spent much of their evolutionary history underwater. Uh, and I put them underwater because water actually can protect you from the the radiation that comes from solar flares. And so if they evolved underwater, then they would be able to um, survive and thrive without uh, being affected by the radiation from their star. Over time, stars do get less magnetically active, and so that happened with, with this star too. And once the star started to get less magnetically active, the Malians came out from the water, uh, but they weren't used to living on the surface, and so they went underground. Uh, you see how all of this is kind of like logical steps uh, based on 
science, right? This, this is my type of world building. I call it facts-based world building. So what else did I think about the Malians? Uh, I imagined what their biology might be like, and because they spent so much of their evolutionary history underwater, I figured they would probably be very fish-like. And so they had scales, they had webs between their fingers. Uh, instead of carrying babies uh, like, like we do in our wombs, in our bodies, uh, they would lay eggs externally and then those eggs would be fertilized, very similar to how fish do, or a lot of uh, marine creatures. Uh, and so I kind of just, I did a lot of research into marine biology, and then I mashed a bunch of it together uh, in a way that I thought was realistic, but also uh, was interesting and, and would help serve uh, the, the progression of my story. Uh, next, I had to think um, beyond biology. I had to think about the culture of this life form, uh, the, you know, the Malian culture. And I, I thought that they were a group of people who spent a lot of time underwater and then emerged from the water into a very harsh environment. Uh, and the way that they escaped their environment, the harsh environment and basically saved their species was by learning about their environment, by using science to figure out the best way to escape a bad situation. And so the most valued trait in Malian society is intelligence. Uh, and so I, I imagined this class structure where scientists are at the top and then engineers and then um, people like miners um, and the people who actually get the materials that the engineers use. And then like way, way, way at the bottom, you have artistic people, uh, people who create and perform and do anything creative or, or anything that the scientists would deem not uh, rigorous enough. So that was the class system. Obviously, this isn't all of the world building that I did. This is just my uh, short summary of the world building. Um, but this was, I think it was almost 200 pages. Uh, you can't explain all of the world building that happens in 200 pages uh, in like five minutes. Uh, even all of the world building that I did before I started writing didn't make it into the 200 pages. World building takes a long time. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that hopefully you will learn from this lesson. So let's move on. Uh, I have given you an example of, of the world building that I did, but what was my process in doing that? Um, I know that you know authors and, and directors and video game creators Everyone has their own process, probably, for how to build a fictional world. This is my process, um, and I hope that it works for you. If it doesn't, that's totally fine. You can find another process that works for you, but I'm going to share mine right now. Uh, so I, I split world building up into answering a few key questions. Um, the first question that I ask is, what makes my world different from other worlds, from our reality? Uh, maybe the difference is really small, like maybe there aren't any squirrels on this planet. And you have to imagine how the, the absence of squirrels would affect the rest of the world. Or maybe the difference is really big, like um, the planet orbits two stars. You know, so, uh, but think about the, what makes your planet, what makes your world different, uh, and then you can start to work from there. Uh, so that's the first question, what makes your world different? Next, how did your world get like that? Uh, some stories are interesting because they actually do the work of answering how the world became the way it is. Um, how, how did a certain group of people come to power? Or how did uh, all of the forests get wiped out? Um, sometimes it's worth asking yourself this question and then, of course, answering it, but it's not always applicable. Sometimes you just want to start with this is the way the world is. It doesn't matter how it got that way. It's just always been like that and carry on. Uh, next, you want to think about the history of the world, its geography, its climate, the physical environment. And this this is very close to the, the setting. This is the setting of the world. Um, this can be really fun. It can involve uh, something like making a map of your world. Um, this map is from Fillory, which is from one of my favorite TV shows, The Magicians, which is actually based on a series of books. Um, but 
once you know your history of the world and the geography and the climate, this once you have this setting, uh, you can actually build people who interact with this world, which is why the next question is what do the life forms on your world or in your world look like? And this seems like a really big question to ask. What's like, what are the actual life forms? You might be wondering why it's the fourth question to ask. And that's because it, it depends directly on the answer to uh, question number three. What's the history, the geography, the climate, the, um, the botany, the like volcanic activity, whatever. Um, once you know what that is like, once you know what the physical environment is like, you can imagine the, t the, the type of life that would uh, form and evolve in that environment. And then once you know what they look like and you know what their environments are like, you can start to think about their culture. And culture is a really hard thing to think about because it goes on and on and on. Learning about other cultures is like turtles all the way down. You will never get to the bottom of it. There's always more to unpack, to uncover, to learn. Uh, culture is endless. And it, if you're building a culture from scratch, it can feel like a never-ending process. Uh, but here are some things, in case you have no idea like what is wrapped up in culture, here are some places to start. Uh, so you have the culture wheel, which looks at different broad categories of what's included in culture, and that's uh, the language, the tools, the arts, what they eat, uh, the values they have, the, the, the stories they tell. Those are all parts of culture, and in each of those let's call them spokes. In each of those spokes on the culture wheel, there's so much embedded in that. Um, like in, in technology and skills alone, uh, think about the technology that we have here on earth. There are different sectors of technology. So there's um, uh, like electronic technology or um, uh, like cooking technology. I'm think I'm like looking at my kitchen right now, but there are so many different things wrapped up in each of these individual spokes. And then you have the cultural iceberg, which is this really amazing uh, visual representation of the idea that some parts of culture are much easier to see than others. And so if you imagine you were going to a different uh, country on earth, a country that you had never been to and you didn't know much about the culture there, as soon as you step off the plane and start interacting with people from that country, there are some things that are going to be really easy to see and notice. Uh, things like the way they dress, the language they speak, the food they eat, the holidays that they celebrate. But there are going to be a lot of other things, actually most of culture is going to be much harder to see and, and observe directly. So those are going to be things like the sense of humor they have, uh, the way that they they treat the family unit, uh, the the way that gender roles are assigned and treated, um, the I'm trying to read uh, like how they view personal space, what is considered rude and what's considered polite in that culture. All of those things much harder to see. Uh, and so these are some places where you can start to think about the culture, uh, but don't. Don't get too wrapped up in it. Don't let yourself get so far into the weeds that you lose sight of the bigger world picture. Uh, so those are the five questions that I recommend asking yourself in that order if you want to build a fictional world. Um, so let's let's do some team practice. I'm going to ask a, a series of questions. It's going to be the same questions from the previous slide, uh, but I'm going to ask these questions and then I'm going to give you some time to come up with answers on your own. And then I'll tell you what my answers to those questions would be, and you can compare. Uh, that doesn't mean that my answers are right, uh, but I've had a lot of experience with world building, uh, and this, this is where uh, my mind goes. If your mind goes somewhere different, that does not mean it's wrong, okay? Uh, so the planet that we're dealing with, the difference between this, this planet and our own Earth, is that this planet gets hit by a lot of asteroids. Um, and asteroids, you can think of them as space junk. They are rocks from space that will come and hit the surface of this planet. Uh, so next, I want you to think about uh, why might that planet get hit by a bunch of asteroids? What might this do to the geography of the planet? How would, how would it affect the climate of the planet? You know, the, the weather patterns?
if at all? Uh, what would the biology of life forms who form and evolve under these circumstances be? Uh, what would they look like? What uh, needs would they have? Would they breathe? Would they see? Uh, would they have the same senses as us? So that's all tied up in biology. Uh, and then finally, what's their culture like? Uh, where do they live? How do they treat each other? Do uh, like What do they value? What do they worship? Things like that. So give yourself, I don't know, maybe five, ten minutes, answer these questions, uh, and then you'll come back and I'll tell you what my answers are. But uh, pause now. All right, welcome back. I hope that your brainstorming session went well. Now I'm going to give you my answers to these questions. All right, so first, why might the planet get hit by a lot of asteroids? As an astrophysicist, my uh, first reaction, uh, trying to be as realistic as possible, is that the planet, over the course of its orbit, uh, intersects with something like an asteroid belt or a Kuiper belt, a part of its planetary system where there are a lot of asteroids. Um, that's my idea. Maybe your idea is something else, is something magical. That's totally okay. Uh, something, an example of something magical might be uh, that these aren't asteroids at all. And in fact, there's um, a, a race of giants who live over the horizon in a mountainous area. And they, uh, one of the things they do for fun is, or maybe not fun, but like one of the things that they feel compelled to do is break up the mountains around them and then throw them as far as they can. And so uh, that looks like a lot of asteroids hitting other parts of the planet. All right, and what, is, what does that do for the geography of the planet? Uh, in my mind, I imagine that if it's constantly being bombarded by rocks, that there are a lot of craters, kind of like our moon, how the moon gets hit by a lot of asteroids uh, and doesn't have the same uh, geological processes that the Earth has, so the craters aren't getting um, cycled through. Uh, it, on this planet, the asteroids happen so frequently that it doesn't have the chance uh, to kind of cycle the surface craters through the rock cycle and, and eliminate the features from the surface. Uh, let's see, is there anything else about geography? Um, at least where the, the asteroids are hitting and where these life forms are, or where the story is taking place, there aren't many mountains. Uh, they're going to be completely destroyed. Not completely destroyed, but like they're going to be pretty destroyed by uh, the, the asteroid just constantly hitting them. There probably aren't many plants on the surface that will uh, take this kind of bombardment. So I imagine it's a very barren surface, um, very just like rocky and not quite deserty, but you know, there, there, there aren't trees, there aren't plants. Uh, another thing uh, that the asteroids bring is radiation. And so there would be a lot of radiation produced by asteroids, by the collisions of these asteroids hitting the ground. And so um, lots of craters, not many mountains or like hills or anything, so very flat, uh, not a lot of plants, and a lot of radiation. Uh, now that feeds directly into the biology. So what would their biology look like? Um, I imagine that because of all of the radiation, maybe they have high levels of mutation. And so uh, it's a, a, a life form that uh, mutates very quickly. And so um, the, the life form is much faster than, than we are. They are changing. They're maybe growing new limbs or appendages or something. This is an interesting example because I feel like the biology and the culture here will play off of each other. Uh, and so one of the first things that I think of when I imagine this planet is that people probably live underground. Uh, and that will affect their biology too, right? Underground, there aren't many sources of light. And so um, they're probably very pale. They probably don't rely too heavily on their eyesight if they have eyesight at all. Um, I, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be humanoid, you know, like uh, a head, two arms, two legs type of structure, uh, but there would be some uh, adaptations that they would have because of their underground lifestyles. Things like uh, maybe claws uh, to help them get around or uh, scurry along the rocks or, or like um, get through rocks very quickly. Uh, is there anything else? There they would 
probably live off of plants that are underground and animals that live underground. So I don't, I, I feel like the line between culture and biology here is pretty blurred. Uh, but let's move further into culture. Uh, and so they, they live underground, um, which probably means they don't have communities that are too, too large, just because if you are you know, communities want to live close to each other, uh, but you it's hard to artificially create very large chambers underground that stay stable. And so they uh, probably can't, they probably don't have homes that are that large, and so their communities are very small uh, or relatively small. What else? Um, I'm just trying to think of things that would be noticeably different from what we have here on Earth. Uh, the technology that they would come up with in their underground societies are things like uh, uh, tools that can tunnel through rock very quickly or ways to trap the animals that live underground or ways to uh, collect or maybe redirect uh, streams that are underwater or, or um, maybe even detecting water because that's going to be a really valuable source. Where you find water, you'll find plants and animals that you can use as food sources. Um, Again, this doesn't cover all of the world building. If what I said was nowhere close to what you said, that's fine. We have different ideas, we've had different experiences, and that leads us to imagine different types of worlds. But now you've seen more of the world building process at work. But let's move on. I have some key things that I want you to remember. Uh, so first, remember that consistency is key. When you are building your world, come up with the rules for your world and stick to them. And this doesn't have to be like laws, um, like, like the political laws that your life forms come up with, but this is something like if you create a system of magic and in that system, magic is passed down uh, like genetically, it's passed down through families, don't then have a person later on who has magic but isn't related to anyone who has powers. Uh, if you create a world where um, people value uh, material things, if, if people value like shiny things, I'm thinking of crow people, right? If you come up with a world where people value shiny things, uh, don't change it later on and have like the biggest city in this world be very dull and drab and colorless. Uh, so consistency is key. Make sure you stick with what you decide early on. And one way to make sure you do this is just to write everything down. When you make a decision, write it down. Write down how it interacts with other decisions that you've made previously. Uh, my next key tip is uh, that world building is an endless process. And I've touched on this already, but uh, it, can, it can go on forever. There's always more to come up with. If you feel yourself getting overwhelmed, just stick to the parts of your world that are super relevant to your story. Um, if your entire story is set on one region of this planet, don't start thinking about what the culture of a race of people on the other side of the planet is like, unless you're going to, in, unless your characters are going to interact with those people. So if you feel yourself getting overwhelmed, limit yourself to the scope of your story. And finally, uh, you have to know your own world to build a new one that's feels rich and full and realistic. Uh, one of my favorite things about world building is that it's, and at least I think so, it's an inherently introspective process. In the act of building a new world, you're thinking about your own. If you're building a new group of people, you're thinking about how uh, your culture acts and what your culture believes in and how uh, your culture interacts with other cultures. If you are building a new uh, terrain, if you're like physically building the, the planet or imagining the planet, you have to think about how our planet works. Learn about how um, tectonic plate movement actually happens and how it affects the surface of a planet. Learn about biology and evolution and psychology and these different scientific disciplines that you can use to make your life forms the most realistic versions of themselves. So knowing about Earth and how Earth works will help you build the best world you can. Uh, and finally, world building, at least the way I do it, facts-based world building, is a combination of science and imagination. And I use those two together to create rich, beautiful worlds that I can't help but want to put stories in.
So those are my world building steps and my world building tips. Now the time has come, my friends, for you to do your own world building. So I'm going to give you four choices for a world to flesh out, uh, and, and here are your choices. The first choice is a world that has unpredictable oceans, and every once in a while, uh, without any type of warning, the ocean comes up onto the land and basically covers all of it so that most of the surface of this planet is water. Your second world is one that has weak gravitational pull, just like the the gravity on the moon is much weaker because the moon is less massive than the earth is, uh, this planet has less gravity, has weaker gravity. And so uh, if you were to go to this planet, you would weigh less. How would that change things? Your third choice is one where there are such thick clouds in the atmosphere that they actually block out most of the sunlight and you can't really see uh, the sun or the moon or the stars uh, that are around this planet. And your fourth one isn't uh, a scientifically realistic one, at least not uh, one that I would interact with in my life as an astronomer, uh, but it's a world where people and animals can communicate with each other. And so what I want you to do is pick one of these worlds. So go ahead, pick one, just one, and that's going to be the world that you uh, build, that you flesh out into a, a fully formed world. Uh, I want you to spend the next 10 minutes brainstorming the answers to the world building questions. Uh, as a reminder, those questions are what makes your world different, although I have answered that question for you. Uh, two, how did your world get that way? Three, what's the history, the geography, the climate like on your world, really setting, uh, coming up with the physical setting of your world? Four, what is the biology of the life forms on this world like? And five, what is their culture like? Okay, so spend the next 10 minutes brainstorming the answers to those questions. You are not going to build an entire world in 10 minutes, I'm telling you now. If you don't get through all the questions, or if you uh, feel like your answers to those questions are very superficial, that's totally fine. This is just the first step in the process, right? So uh, you have 10 minutes, press pause now. All right, so my main creative outlet comes in the form of writing. I have tried to draw, I have tried to sing, I have tried to sculpt, it doesn't work. I've, I've owned up to it, it's just not gonna happen for me. But I can write creatively. And so I've imagined this as a writing exercise, but I want you to feel comfortable doing whatever uh, creative artistic expression you uh, feel is your strong suit. Uh, so uh, I want you to, you've, you've built your world. I'm sure it's fantastic. I want you to imagine the story Cinderella as if it were set in your world. And I've picked Cinderella because we all know the story of Cinderella. Uh, Cinderella lives with her stepmother and wicked stepsisters, uh, and the prince throws a ball. Uh, Cinderella wants to go to the ball, but her, step her stepmother and stepsisters tell her she can't. Uh, her fairy godmother comes and gives her a dress and transports her to the ball where she meets the prince, they fall in love, and then she has to run away, um, blah, 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 blah. I'm sure that you know the story of Cinderella. I am giving this as your prompt because I don't want you to have to think of story. I want you to really focus on the world building aspect of this exercise. So uh, think about Cinderella and how it would be different, but like keep the plot the same and the characters the same. Although, let's be real, feel free to play around with like the race and gender of the characters. Um, keep the story and characters the same, but put it in a different world. Thinking back to that asteroid world that we thought about more or less together, um, maybe because those life forms uh, live underground and they don't rely on eyesight, Cinderella's fairy godmother doesn't put her in a beautiful dress. She gives her uh, an irresistible perfume or gives her the most amazing singing voice uh, because those are the things that will get her noticed by the prince. Um, so think about how Cinderella would be different in the world that you chose. Uh, write a story, uh, draw a picture, sculpt something, whatever. Um, but yeah, that's that's my uh, prompt to you. Uh, and then once you do that, I encourage you to share your work. Uh, 
if you want to and if you're comfortable. And so I've set up a Slack channel. Uh, it's for a community of world builders like yourself who want to learn about world building from other people. And so once you've written your story or drawn your picture or whatever, uh, you can join this Slack channel and uh, you can upload your work to the channel. Uh, and then you can talk to other people about their own work and you can offer each other constructive feedback, uh, make sure it's all constructive. Uh, but yeah, that's sharing. Um, I also have a few other resources for you. Uh, so first is if you do that and you want to get more world building, world building practice, but you don't quite know where to start, here are some exercises for you. So first, uh, create a world that is exactly like ours. It's, it's Earth, it's realistic Earth, except for one key historical difference. So maybe uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was never a assassinated or the Library of Alexandria never burned down. Uh, but pick one historical event and imagine it never happened. How would that influence the course of events in the future? And then think of that world, build that world. A second prompt is to create a totally unrealistic fantasy world with a magic system that works and mythical creatures. Um, I read almost exclusively fantasy books, and so I would love to see the fantastical, mystical worlds that you come up with. Uh, third is to create, it's kind of a blend of the first to uh, create a world that realistically or scientifically explains a mythical concept. A really good example of this is Peeps by Scott Westerfeld. In that series, uh, Westerfeld imagines vampirism. So there are vampires, but instead of vampires being magical, mystical creatures, uh, it's caused by an actual virus. So it's a disease that people get so the symptoms of the disease lead people to behave like vampires from myths do. And so those are three different types of worlds that you can build. You can definitely share those on the Slack channel too. And then here I have some resources for you. So I didn't learn how to build fictional worlds through books, but there definitely are people who have written books on world building. And there are people who uh, have amazing blogs and vlogs about world building. So you should, if, you're, if you want more resources, you should look those up. Uh, here are those resources. Uh, and then here's a list of examples of, I think, great speculative fiction uh, that have done amazing world building. Hopefully you've been following along on the worksheet. Uh, these resources are also listed there. If you haven't been following along on the worksheet, I really encourage you to go to my website, moyamctier.com. That's M-O-I-Y-A-M-C-T-I-E-R.com. And you can find this worksheet and this video, uh, but you already have the video. Uh, you can find the worksheet that's uh, connected to this video there, uh, and it'll lead you through the different exercises that we did in this lesson. I really hope that helped. Uh, I know that this is a very kind of like surface level how to world build, uh, but if you're looking for examples of worlds and if you like the way that I think of facts based world building, I have a show called Exolore uh, where I interview expert guests who are experts in anything that's not astronomy. So in the past, I've talked to psychologists, ecologists, epigeneticists, linguists, uh, sociologists, whatever. Uh, and I interview them and together we imagine the life and culture on a different alien planet each time. And so I, I uh, post those regularly on my YouTube channel. Uh, you can also find the link to that on my website, uh, moyamctear.com. Yeah, I wish you all the best on your world building journey. I would absolutely love to see the worlds that you build. So please uh, join the Slack channel. Uh, reach out on Twitter if you use the hashtag exolore, E-X-O-L-O-R-E, uh, then I can follow along with your world building journey. I'd really love to see what you do. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time to go through this lesson. Uh, Good luck. Bye.